nuestro invitado, Peter de Lord Rider. Y bueno, al final les vamos a hacer como una, una, un resumen de toda la, la plática que vamos a tener en caso de que pues no hable en inglés. No se preocupen, ahorita vamos a hacer algo general. Oh, hello, Peter, how are you? Hey, man, I love it when you speak not my language. <laughs> I didn't understand Spanish, the word, but it sounded Spanish. great. I know, I'm, I, I, it's my language to learn, and I suck at it currently. Yeah. So, I, one, once, this is actually uh, sort of, I, I got taught by um, uh, Dave Catching at a, and Josh Homme, actually, at, at an after party after Queens of Stone Age back in 1998. I, they taught me the only Spanish I know. It's... <laughs> El gato, el gato está bajo la mesa. Is that, does that mean <laughs> that the cat is under the table? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Good Spanish, good Spanish. <laughs> There we go. That's, that's what you, I know, buddy. We, yeah, we're going to teach you new words in, in Spanish, of course. <laughs> only, only cuss words, please. <laughs> on, 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 well, welcome, like really, welcome really to the stuff. show. Thank yeah. you so welcome much. Can, can you hear this, by the way? <laughs> Sorry. Can you hear the bass? Can you hear the bass? Yeah, 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 I can hear the bass. Yeah. Distorted or not? Uh, no. Can you hear, like, the I full will signal? Play again. Can you just hear like? Yes. Oh, yes, just I me can... rattling. Or the actual? Yeah, amp I can sound? hear it. Um. Okay. It's like a no. middle point. No. <laughs> okay. Then, 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 okay, then okay. just let's never, never mind the bass. I was trying to get like the bass on there if. For some reason, okay. Never mind that. All right, let's okay, just okay. let's just stick to talking, well, man. Yeah. The, the first question is: Tell us a bit about the beginning of Lowrider, Rider, how you formed the band, and how do you discover Stoner Rock in Sweden back in the nineties? Uh, you know, discovering it in Sweden back in the nineties, you there was nothing to discover. There was like, I mean, this is also pre, so maybe there was a couple of other out there like like Tommy from Dozer and whatnot, but we weren't connected at all. Cause they're like, you went to your local record store and like, that's how you got your records. And the people you knew who liked the same stuff were from your town. And that's the guys you started yeah. a band with. That's just like how everything was back in the day. I guess to some degree now, but I mean, if you, if you're liking a very fringe band now, there is always going to be other people online who you can talk to about it. But then it was literally like I had pen pals that I wrote to talking about Caius with. <laughs> This is like, yeah. I'm starting to, I, I sound like a very old man and <laughs> I'm old, but the thing is I was like 14 at the time. So that helped. I was a kid then. So anyways, I mean, when we started out, uh, there wasn't really a scene. I, I stumbled upon like the whole stoner thing with, Uh, I found Monster Magnet and like Fu Manchu, uh, and I liked that. But then I I happened to like find is that Lucy guys? I can only see myself. Yeah, that's oh, there. okay. I'm here. I'm still here. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no worries. All right. <laughs> uh, so so the thing is like uh, I found Kaya's with their like last record just before they broke up, and no one really listened to them i mean they had a little bit of attraction in the states but like the whole stoner rock thing was only happening like i'd say like seven years later or something yeah, like yeah. that it was it was like even when we started playing uh i was like the 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 guy that was into that kind of music in my town i had like two friends that i knew a little bit that sort of yeah they're monster magnus cool But I'm more like a discharge guy, or like I like early punk or whatever. But I, I like that too. But like I, but we all like Black Sabbath. That was like the the the, the glue. Uh, but I mean, it was maybe I was sort of I was I'm from a quite a small town, but maybe I was I was uh, uh, I don't know. I, I I had a weird sense of of what normal is, like how many bands are from your town. <laughs> Because from my yeah. town, like everyone was in a band, uh, and that's just oh, really? what they did. Wow! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like everyone was in a band, and it was there was like just like some of the best bands still I know were from my town. Uh, wow! So 
What what Which what I started I went out for tempo. When I the thing is when when I wanted to start playing, I was just like I I went out and pretty much just like grabbed a hold of the coolest musicians. Like I stole them from other bands in my town. So Ula, who yeah. plays the guitar and sings in Lowrider alongside me, uh, the lead guitarist, he was actually a bass player in this awesome band called Elope, who sounded like I'd say if you cross like early Black Sabbath and CC Top with the Beatles and cream okay. they were like they were the the their debut ep is like i've given it to people and it's like some people are like this is my new favorite band now because <laughs> they're okay. they were that good, good. but they did that just like a lot of bands they never just never happened for them uh but they were like this awesome power trio and ula plays guitar with us he played bass there so he was like my bass hero uh Okay. But then I realized, like, oh, he's an even better guitarist. Uh, so I played the bass. He, uh, I was just like, let's jam sometime. And it was him, me, and then this other guy that w went to our school. We just, in our local, like, you know, the music classroom at school, we just, at nighttime, we got the keys and, like, oh, can we jam? And they were like, okay. So we, <laughs> we just jammed and and uh recorded this demo that i still have and we're actually thinking about putting on like a bonus track on the next post wax record uh because yeah, it's like let's the first... do it please yeah it's it's like it's like the first rehearsal ever and it's actually kind of good it's like it sounds like just a, a plummet plummeting uh like freight train but it's got something there's something there and and then we were just cool. like we were inspired we were inspired to to like just let's do this again and then um <clears throat> the guy who was working in the uh as sort of uh just a you know working as an an, an extra job in in the music hall at school that was nicholas who now plays guitars with lowrider oh he was really just like, what Whoa. what it was just like what what are you what are you guys up to it was like oh we we're just playing a little like what kind of music and i was just like uh, like Caius, sort of. It's like, what? What's Caius? It's like it sounds sort of like Black Sabbath. It was like, okay, cool. Can I borrow the record? And he's like, yeah, oh. here you go. And and the, and then we just became friends. And he came to the next rehearsal, and that was pretty much it. Me, uh, me and Ola and him were just like this trio of like we were just playing instrumental and really loud. And then out of like I don't know, we just stumbled upon this thing that Jad from who now has Blues Funeral recordings with me. Yeah, yeah. He was just starting this label called Meter City. And he was trying to get bands yes. to, to get on this compilation. And we, uh, just out of like happenstance, Nicholas was going to this, um, he was studying to become an, an audio engineer, like a mixing engineer. So he, he had like, uh, he could get a really good studio that he was studying in for free. So he really is like, oh, we could, I have this song. Well, let's try to record it. So we went there and recorded. We didn't have a drummer. So I, I played the drums. I'm not a drummer. Oh, <laughs> but, but yeah. So, and the first two tracks we recorded, that was just two demos. One of them was Texas part one and two. And we just, we sent oh. that to, yeah, we, we sent that to, to Jad in the compilation. Just like, ah, we'll see what, just see what happens. Maybe we can get some feedback. Yeah. And he was just like, hello, this is Jad from Meter Cedar Records. <laughs> Send an email back. Like, <laughs> we really we really like the song. We'd like to give you an offer to be on the compilation. I was just like, dude, oh, I'm, I'm I'm like 17 years old. You're like making my dream come true oh. right now. <laughs> yeah. So and and from then sort of it just snowballed because we had only recorded that demo. And that demo become becomes like the first release. And we actually yes. had to like, I don't know, mute some of the drums because the drums were so bad. The drums I was playing <laughs> on that. It's actually it like some of the section was so hot. Like, I don't know, it, it, it had a jazzy feel, but you can hear I'm not a drummer. But uh, but like then we were like, uh, OK, they they want to do an we they want us to do like an EP with Nebula. We better maybe get a yes. drummer. And, Actually, and then, yeah, I, I uh, want to ask you about that. <clears throat> yeah, they, that was sort of just a follow up from the compilation because apparently people like the track we had on the compilation. We're like, who are these guys? Are they putting out anything more? 
And then Jad was just like, people want to hear more music. Do you have any? And I was just like, oh, I, we got a couple of songs. Uh, <laughs> I was just like, okay, okay. And so, and I had like, I don't know, a couple of riff ideas, but the, then Nicholas was just like, Hey, we better get a drummer. I, I got this guy in class at the mixing engineer class who he's really good. I was just like, okay, let's try him. And that's Andreas. So he, he just sort of, we just stumbled upon playing in this band. We didn't really know each other before like rehearsing. Uh, I knew yeah. Ula a lot, but but not Nicholas or Andreas that well. So we sort of we became friends from from like having to do this EP, uh, and they're like, <laughs> okay, that we just have to record this thing, and we didn't really rehearse that much. We sort of just figured stuff out in the studio, and uh, <clears throat> I mean, I didn't have any studio at home to like record demos or anything, so we just went in and had like studio time. And we're like, we're doing this now, I guess, and figuring out everything like on the spot. So that's why, like, if you listen to that EP, every track has like a new drum sound and a new guitar sound, and a new bass sound, because we were recording <laughs> them like every other weekend. We were recording a, a song in yeah. the studio and we had to take down the mics and everything from each session and we didn't write up like what guitar pedals we used. We were just like, <laughs> oh, just figure something out. Something that sounds good. <laughs> so that, that EP like is sonically, it's like all over the place, but that's sort yeah. of the charm but, with it. Yeah. yeah. But, but, to, but that's sort of hand, how that happened. I, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But, but to the other hand, I mean, I need to be very honest. This is one of my favorite splits in the stoner rock scene. It's the masterpiece. Cool. I mean, La Menezma is one of the best songs, you know? It's very funny. I mean, 17 years old and you create this amazing music. I can't believe it. <laughs> I, I, I mean, the thing is, I just I just had all these riffs. And, like, I, I, I was so heavily into Black Sabbath. I For me, like, La Menezma, I love that track. But that just, for me, is just, like, my... It's like, if, if I were to steal all the best things from Black Sabbath, it's, like, there. You, you can pretty much hear, <laughs> hear the influences. But the, there was something about how we just did something on the fly where it felt, I don't know, I, 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 I hope it just feels honest and, and that if yeah. it sounds like a band having a lot of fun. And, and also, if I would like give any advice to any band is like, get a really good drummer <laughs> and have a <laughs> yeah. really good lead guitarist. Those things help. Yes. Um, yeah, the, yeah, the, the fact that we've all that yeah the fact that we've always had andreas as sort of the backbone of the band with the drums had even if like some guitar part is sloppy or the bass part is sloppy the the sort of what glues everything together and makes it sound like that elevated level is is his drumming yeah. i'd i'd say and th that was actually yeah, like the first right, thing we right. recorded with with, with him cuz th yeah the thing is the ep is a sort of like collection of songs that we recorded during like half a year uh and the first oh, track okay, was okay. Lamin, what was Lamin, what was Lamineshma. that was like the first track which where we almost like tried out andreas like how is this going to work in the studio and we we're like it, it worked out pretty good <laughs> uh, so <laughs> so yeah uh, uh so um i i because the thing is i had like demos of that track where i played the drums so I knew how shitty it sounded with me. <laughs> and then he came in and, yeah. and did the drums. And I was like, okay, we've got ourselves a drummer. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's that's how he happened. And that's then really, after really that. That's really, cool. It's. <clears throat> Sorry, you were saying. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, an amazing story. I mean, 17 years old and you create these massive riffs. Actually, I have a question uh, talking about gear and things like that. So, well, I'm going to read the, the full full question no for worries. you bands Go like ahead, like no yeah bands like dozer uh low rider of course demon cleaner blind dog have created a unique heavy stoner sound i'm curious about what would you think influence the sound and maybe some particular amps pedals or something like that because the sweden stoner scene is very unique you know caius is heavy but you took this the sounds uh, to the next level so i'm curious what happened i mean in sweden in general in this scene 
I, I, w I wish I knew, buddy. It's like, the thing is, when we started out playing, there were, like, one other band in our town that really liked Kaya's, and they sounded like a like a raw punk version of it. They were really good, uh, called Sparzanza. They then evolved into, like, this more of a, like, a metal, melodic metal band, but, like, for the, the first couple of, like, singles and stuff they did, we were, like, the, the buddy bands in the town. Uh, and we actually did a split single with them where like they did one track and we did Love and Eshma. That, that was like where that initially was released. We self-released that one with them. <coughs> but then I started like, um, I started talking to this guy on this forum online where Jad was also. And that, that guy was Tommy from Dozer. And he was like, oh, I have this band where we're called Lowrider. I've got a, like a couple of songs. And he was like, yeah, I'm in this band called Dozer. Maybe we should trade tape demos. So I, yeah, sure. So I, I, I sent him our demo, like the Lamanishma demo, or it was like the one that we recorded in the studio, but it, was, it wasn't mastered. But I sent that to him. And then he sent back a tape that was there, like something as like 69 demo. It was like the first thing they did that then became like some of the yeah, tracks on yeah, the yeah. Master Ruin. Where like the first opening song was Super Soul, and I was just like, "Okay, this is something different." I was just like, "These these guys get it." Uh, yeah. So it was sort of like an instant instant sort of connection there with Tommy, where we just like understood each other, and then we pretty much I called him on the phone like every other day, and we were just like like people are chatting on like Facebook or whatever now. That was what was yeah, yeah. on the phone. <laughs> so we were pretty much just talking music like all day long i had like you know like a regular phone that you had to dial up that i was like living at yeah, home yeah, yeah. and i and i i called him for like three hours a day and we were just talking about music until like awesome. my, my, my my mom came along like hey i i got the phone bill it's kind of like <laughs> it's expensive what happened he was like oh i i, I got a new friend that up north <laughs> like i i got a buddy uh... I, we've been talking a lot it's like just so you know the, the those calls aren't are for free that was like back in the day when when like these calls calling like to the other side of the country was expensive for some reason but yeah okay it was it was like it was just like the dawn of the internet where like you you weren't talking there already so anyways we became friends and then we talked to, and then we both got on the meteor city compilation along with sparzans and like demon cleaner and a couple of other bands and then you realize like oh here's like a couple of bands it's, it wasn't really a scene but it was still like oh here's a couple of bands that were on this compilation maybe we should do like yeah. a release party together for the for the thing so oh, those four yeah. bands actually met up and uh, we we traveled up to dozer's hometown and played a gig there and I, i'd say maybe that is like the, the some sort of a birth of a scene Cause that was like in 90, oh. ni that was like in 98. I was actually not wow. old enough to be, to be at the club where we played. Cause you were supposed, <laughs> you had to, you, you had to, you had to be 18 to be at the place cause they're ser yeah. serving alcohol. And I was 17. Yes. So I was like super nervous coming there. Like maybe, maybe they're not going to allow us to play cause I'm 17. <laughs> and they're like, just don't tell them. It's like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can do that. You can you don't have to tell the people <laughs> so so a kid was playing and drank beer at this place i was being illegal and happy about it um <laughs> but anyways it, that was a really good start of a of like what then involved uh evolved to us realizing oh there's people in you know the brew doing this thing as well they've got this thing called, a band called truck fighters oh they're kind of cool like yeah got their got their first demos like oh that's cool and but that was like a couple of years later, um, where like oh they like Lowrider a lot. It's like oh oh that's cool. Then that was like when we started to almost like not rehearse as much, like in two thousand one two thousand two, and we like we moved to different cities and, you know, it was Aww. just like we didn't really we didn't really disband. We just like didn't rehearse as much, and then we realized a couple of years there we're like, hey we haven't really rehearsed for like two years, <laughs> what's up? And then yeah. <laughs> It it was just like a long hiatus, but in that hiatus, we realized like, oh, there's like something brewing here, where like all these younger bands came up, 
they weren't younger they were just hadn't played as long <clears throat> and what and and some of them were like really hungry and like productive like truck fighters and were like putting out a lot of records and touring a lot so of course they got got a lot of momentum from that while we were like doing other stuff and getting kids and whatnot and we weren't touring so i mean the whole sort of scene happened a little bit after us and then it sort yeah. of like started exploding in europe and england and, and germany so by the time like we realized like oh this record we did ode to io people are apparently uh -huh. they like that so but that sort yes, of snowballed I... <laughs> after the fact it's a little bit like what happened to kaya's as well they they called it quits in in like 95 and I think they were yeah, they were at like, like their yeah. the, they had their biggest peak I'd say like year like between five and ten years after, just because it yes. sort of it takes like time for word of mouth to get to people and I don't know it, it same thing happened to to Io and us so then like yeah. the the nice people at, at Desert Fest gave us a call like hey guys would you reform the band oh. for a show and we were like. I was then in another band and like doing a whole different thing. This more like indie rock band called IR Droid that I was doing for a while. And I was just about to like release the second record for that. And I was like, I don't know if I can do Lowrider now. They're going to be pissed off because they've just invested on our second record. And I was like, okay, we'll just do the <laughs> one show. And then we did those Desert Fest shows and it was like insane. <laughs> it, it, there were so many people in the love. The love was just so massive and we were like realized like oh wow something happened to this while we were gone um so yeah it, it was it was just a, a very different thing uh yeah, when we uh, came talking back. about yeah talking about other to to eo i want to ask you how you record that album i mean this is a masterpiece of stoner rock and everybody loves this album it's one of the best i mean in my opinion so how you record that album i mean with 19 years old or 18 years old something like that yeah by by by, by then i was 19 i i turned 20 on the tour we did with those or for oh. for but it's it i mean at the at the time i thought i was like i'm a grown-up because i'm 20 now and now i realize like when you're 20 you're just a kid but but yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> i mean it, it it is what it is when when you're 19 you're oh, i'm i'm grown up but yeah, I was I was just productive, <laughs> trying to get things done. But we the O2IO we recorded in the same studio as the EP. It was it was now by now like both Andreas and Nicholas had finished the uh, the they've taken their exam from like the in class, and both were like uh, mixing engineers. So and they had trained in the, in the studio at school. So. We were just like, oh, Jad asked if we wanted to do an, a record. And he was like, I, I have this amount. It's not a lot, but I have this amount of money. Can you do anything with it? It's like, and we just went to the guy who had the school studio. And it was like, <laughs> hey, if if you get this money, can for how long can we have the studio? And he was like, yeah, you can have it for two weeks. It's like, okay. <laughs> so we, okay. we just... <laughs> Yeah, we pretty much just like got our our sleeping bags and and pillows and moved into the studio for two weeks, and I had <clears throat> six songs that I knew I wanted to do for the record, and then a couple of like really rough demos on like cassette tape that I just had recorded myself. I didn't have like everything figured out yet, so and we pretty much just recorded day and night and mixed it ourselves as we went along so it was just the four of us in the studio and andreas and nicholas was like mixing it mostly andreas um and it, it was just like i don't know a labor of love but we we started hating each other by like day 10 when we hadn't slept that much uh... and, you, know, <laughs> you, you know you just like you, you're in the same space all the time and yeah. there was no like the only thing we had was a, like a sega mega drive to play other than that, we were just like, you know, <laughs> stuck with each other. No internet, not, not, there was nothing like anything fun to do on the times off. You can just sit there and listen to the same songs you've heard now for like 10 days. <laughs> and you, you start to doubt like, oh, this all sounds like shit. 
It's like all I hate all the riffs. <laughs> My vocals sound like shit. Uh... And it's just like I just want to do something else for a while. But but yeah, we had to finish it because we knew like in four days we were out of time. Uh, so. <laughs> At, at like the last two days, I was just like, we need another song. I have, I have this on cassette. I was just playing it. Like it was just drums and a guitar and I was playing it to Andreas. It was just like, uh, do you think we could figure it out? Like, is it, cause I think it's, there's something there. It's kind of cool. Is like, I, I, I think so. And then we went in and I just showed him the parts like two times and then he recorded the drums and then we just layered it and until it was finished. And that's Ode to Io, the final track. So that that Ooh. was like, I, I actually, <laughs> actually, it actually wasn't supposed to be on the record, really. It was like, I just had this idea for maybe something to record later. But then we recorded, it was just like, oh, this is kind of, this is kind of heavy now. So, yes. so yeah, it, that's just, it just became like the, the natural sort of finale to the record. And it also really, got, really got cool. the name, the name from the record. So um yeah so yeah it's sort of it's sort of a bow tie on the end of the record where it feels like oh this is now it's not done but yeah the, the whole record was that's why that record sounds very much the same compared to the ep yes the ep would recorded like on one song at a time over like half a year while this was recorded yes. uh during like 10 weeks or t 10 days and then mixed in like two three days um Wow. All at the same time, so that's why it it sounds more like cohesive, uh, in that way, because it's it's like recorded more of like in a punk fashion where you just like let's just go, that's like that's a good guitar sound. Let's just like move on, um, yeah, and, and yeah, so so uh, that's that's how that came about, pretty much. Man, just, that's a really good story. <laughs> well, yeah, it's well, sort of I a, I want to ask you, yeah, yeah. After 20 years, you recorded your second album, Refractions, considered by many as the best album of the year, well, in 2020. So what's the story behind this release? What motivates you to go back to the studio to record this? And how is the recording itself different from the first one? Well, the thing is, uh, by doing Ode to Io the way I told you, I realized like I don't ever want to do a record that like that again. Because I think Otoayo, hearing it now, I just hear everything I would want to like do differently or add to it. I think it's really, I love it just because it's raw and maybe I shouldn't change anything. But now that I've gotten like over the last 20 years, I've gotten a lot more into like music production and like layering it with a lot of like sprinkling a lot of nice stuff in there. I just hear all like, oh, I would want to have that little thing there and that little thing there. And that kind of stuff, for that to happen, you need time. Just to, for, to like, okay, record something, let it go for a couple of days, and then come back to it, listen like, oh, this is now missing like, I don't know, like a tambourine or another drum part or just like a little guitar lick or something. And if you were, like we recorded o to io if you're just recording, 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 and you're just like looking at, oh, the deadline is soon, you're going to be like, I don't know, it's going to go like this. And you're only yes, going to be like, yes, yes. that can be a cool thing if you want something that's raw and direct. But for for this one, the songs I had in my head were like so different. And some of them yeah. needed like a huge production with like a lot of like organs and shit. So I, I, I and also after the gigs at Desert Fest in 2013, we realized like, oh, if we do another record, the only thing we can do is fuck it up. It's like, like people's expectations are now up here. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> we don't, we're, we're, we're not just making a record. We need to like do the one to follow up Ode to Io, which is like, you, you can never meet anyone's expectations. So for like the first couple of years there in like 2014 and 15, when I started to like record stuff, I tried to do like Ode to Io too just to make people happy like oh, i'm new, i'm doing another ode to io yes and it it and all the stuff just sounded like garbage and it just sounded so it was just like this sounds dated and it's just like not fun so the 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 where it started to sound good again 
was where I I had a, other tracks recorded where it was like I wasn't really intending those for Lowrider. It was just like ideas I recorded because like I was so inspired by oh it's a cool riff, but it's like it doesn't sound like Lowrider. It was just like maybe I'll do that with something else like Greenleaf or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then I kept kept coming it kept coming back to those riffs and like that's a really fucking cool riff. It's just like, <laughs> and I, I was just like, I was just like, so what if like, who, who, who defines what low rhetoric is or can be? And then when I started to like allow those, those ideas to be low rhetoric and we started trying those out, that's when like, man, this is like what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to do these songs. And like the first song that, came out of like that realizing like we can do anything as long as we feel like doing we we feel like hyped about it like oh this is cool as long as we're doing it it's going to sound like lowrider and the first track was oh to ganymede that was actually this i had this back from like 2012 it wasn't supposed to be for lowrider and i just realized like no this is this is the first track we're going to pretty much open with it's yeah. so and when we started playing it and just adding it together, it was just like, this song doesn't make sense at all. It's like this first one minute thing. And then it's another one minute thing. And then it's a break for 40 seconds where it's just mellow. And then it explodes into this long jam thing that it's a different thing. Yeah. And then there's like another thing for two minutes. And then it's, a, it's the last thing for like, I don't know, another minute. And there's no real chorus or verse. And the whole thing is like what eight, seven or eight minutes long. It's just like it's, it doesn't make sense. But that's when I realized like that's exactly what made us record Texas Part One and Two. It was the same thing where it's just like I have these couple of cool yeah. things. Let's put them together and it's a song now. That's how it started. Where we weren't thinking about like yeah. trying to follow up anything. So that unlocked everything. So that when like 2015, 16, somewhere there. That's when we're like, oh no, we're doing these cool, like weird songs that we don't think belong. <laughs> That's the songs we're gonna do for for this EP. Uh, and then we realized like, oh, the songs are like seven, eight, eleven minutes long. This is not an EP. <laughs> this is an album. It's like, sure, it's six no. songs, but it's like it's really long. So that's when we realized, like, we're not working on an EP anymore. We're working on a, on the the follow up to, to O to I O here, and then we started listening to this because we we gave it time this time. Like we recorded something and then we waited like two months, and then listened to it. Like, uh, maybe put like a guitar part here and whatnot, and that so it slowly grew over like seven years, really, uh, and. I think that's why it sort of feels so f done and I'm so happy with it. Yeah, it's like, yeah. we, we, we had the time to, we could have released it in 2014, but it would have been not as good. And it would have been, some songs wouldn't have been on there. And a lot of really cool ideas would have been like half baked. So what, what's the, like the Hammond solo, on Ode to Ganymede, for example, that was like that just came to me after like having the demo for, for my like two years. I was just like, oh, I'm hearing it and Hammond solo now. And and then I, I just took out the guitar for that part and just let, left it open and send it over to to my buddy, like from when we grew up, one of the other guys from the other bands from when I grew up. That I knew was like he's like John Lord uh, reinc reincarnated. He's like so good at, <laughs> at organ. Uh, he used to like yeah. play a real Hammond organ in, in bands when we were growing up. Like he carried a, an actual Hammond organ around for gigs. So he's like the real thing. And I was just like, I texted him and he just got his first kid. <clears throat> and I was just like, hey, uh, we've got this song. I really want you to play a Hammond solo on it. And he was like, I, I just became a father. I have no time. I don't sleep at all. I'm like, oh. I don't have time. I'm, ch I'm changing diapers all the time. I was like, do you have any time <laughs> at all? He was like, wait, tomorrow my wife is going to go out with our baby for like 20 minutes. <laughs> send, send me the song. Uh. 
and he was he literally <laughs> recorded that the Hammond solo you hear on the record yeah is his is his first take when he was just recorded at home in his kitchen uh and he was like this is all i could do he just sent it to me like i i <laughs> I, I just i just had 10 minutes when they were out so here, here's the here's the thing i was just like are you are you kidding me this is perfect so this is yeah, the Hammond, the Hammond, the Hammond solo you you hear on the record is like his only and first take, and he, he just said it back. And I, I'm <laughs> that's I'm awesome. still just like, yeah. But so uh, and that's a lot of like how that record was built, is like just spur of the moment recordings, but far apart. So uh, yeah, that that's how we record like the guitars and everything. It was just like. This was before Corona, but I mean, it was, we live in different cities. Yeah. So Ula would like drive two hours to the studio where I work and we would just like record his guitars all that are all night long. And then the next couple of weeks, I was just sitting, listening to the takes and just trying to find stuff. But most of his stuff was just like him hearing the tracks, maybe for like the first or second time. So he was just like, I was just like, here's the solo part, just go. <laughs> So most of like the solos you hear on there are also very like spur of the moment, which I think helps yeah. make the the record feel like kind of just spontaneous, even though it's very produced. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. It feels it, it remembers Funkadelic, you know, the records of Funkadelic. It's just one. Thing, oh, yeah. You no, know, it's just, just in the moment. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. the thing is, well, I think I think you need, you need to have your songs like written and figured out. So someone needs to have like, this is what we're doing. But then I, I think it's really good if like the performers coming in, like the, the drummer or the lead guitarist or sometimes the vocalist can come in and just have like fresh ears and just go. And then like the first yeah. like spur of the moment idea you have, some of the times it's just like is the best thing. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Well, I have a special question from my friend Gerardo. He traveled to mm -hmm. see you in the UK. So Gerardo, well, I'm going to read the, the full questions for Gerardo. Well, Gerardo is one of the most dedicated fans of the Sweden stoner scene. He managed to see you in London with Dozer. He asked, what mm -hmm. do you think about the new Swedish stoner scene? Because in the past, it was a close scene, but bands like, like you, Greenleaf, Dozer, Demon Cleaner... Uh, Everything. It's, so, you're, how do you it's, feel? It's, it's, it's kind of, the, the, the funny thing is, like, those four bands you're talking about are like the same five yeah. guys. It's like, <laughs> it's like, it's the smallest. Not Lowrider, not Lowrider, but like Demon Cleaner, Dozer, and Greenleaf in the beginning were like the same people yeah. from Boiling. <laughs> so it, it was a very small <laughs> thing. But then, yeah, Greenleaf became like this sort of just everyone came in to collaborate yeah. with Tommy, basically. Uh, so, I mean, over the years, that has been a really fun project. And now it's, just, it's, it's again, become more of like a real band where they have the last couple of records yeah. have been the same people. And I think it's going to stay that way. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is, I never loved it when it was just a small scene. It's beautiful that it's now like uh, a lot of people in bands and just trying to yes. help each other that's that the, the the strength is in like the numbers of how how many are interested <laughs> in the thing that's just that's just like maths so we wouldn't ha be having this conversation if it wasn't for like the scene really because if people weren't didn't care about the record we did 20 years ago we we no no one would care about us enough for me to be able to do refractions I did refractions because I like, oh, people want another lowrider record. And then I realized like, oh, I really want to make another lowrider record. And us as a band just felt like, no, we're not done yet. <clears throat> and then when we started playing again, <clears throat> there was just a magic there where it was like, we're just having too much fun. It's just like, we can't not do another record, but then wanted to do it justice. But yeah, I'd say like the, the whole reason that that we exist is because of all the people and all the new bands that are sort of carrying this, the scene and making it what it is. Cause I mean, now stone rock and sort of the whole sludge doom thing, that's sort of, it, yeah. it's not mainstream, but it's, it's like definitely like 
known by more a lot of people. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you if you drop a band like or a name like Fu Manchu, like people who don't even really know what Stone Rock is would probably have heard them. And that was yeah. like not the case when when we were starting out. It was like so fringe and no one knew what like Desert Rock or Stone Rock was. And we were like 20 people when we were playing at gigs. And just be able to now yeah. come to a festival where like there's four or 5,000 people dedicated to this kind of music and everyone knows everyone. It's just a, such a beautiful, familiar thing where playing at like the Desert Fest shows is like it's like coming home. It's 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 awesome, and I, I I it's become sort of like one of the biggest gifts I say in my life to have to have this band sort of and the scene just become this thing where we I don't know we're we're just happy to be a part of it really. Yeah, and and I think it's uh, the same. For example, in Mexico, a couple of years ago, nobody cares about this this kind of sound. They have some local bands. They play in some bars, and nobody cares. But in the last uh, seven, five years, maybe the stoners you know, start to grow in, and that's why I can yeah. I can talk with you. I have this show. Yeah. Same things to to that. So yeah. uh, the people start to care about this kind of sound, heavy riffs, psychedelic riffs. So I think it's the, a good moment to to be alive. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, I, I, the only thing we can do is really like if if people want us to play, who are we to be like difficult? Be like, no, we don't want to we're supposed to be secretive and like ah oh, we're just like yeah. we're just happy to we're just happy to do it so i i mean pe people are like sometimes people come up to us like i didn't think you would be like these happy cheerful guys you look like you're having so much fun it's like what are you crazy <laughs> like <laughs> if, if if you're allowed to just kind of music in front of people and people actually show up for, for the gigs you get to play in like london and Berlin and and like I don't know, and the other side of the globe. If you're not happy, then then do something else. It's like it. It's, yeah, you're right. I I just feel it's like our responsibility to have a good time, uh, both for ourselves getting this opportunity, and then for the people who actually traveled and showed up. And if we're not having a good time, then yeah, there's a lot of other stuff you can do with your life uh yeah, so yeah, but right. i mean for, for 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 the time being we just love doing this and we're definitely going to have more music out really soon um yeah perfect i, I have a uh, other question i don't have much time i have a lot of questions man I, I did. <laughs> really, yeah but we'll we send you a message probably later but well tell us about yeah. your relationship with yeah. the, the with the label Buse funeral recordings and what is post wax records well, the thing is, a uh, blues funeral is really like uh, it's my uh, love letter together with Jad to uh, this kind of music. Jad, who had who signed us to begin with, he got out of the music business in like late two thousands. He sold Meter City and just started doing other stuff, and then he realized like he contacted me and was just like dude, I, I, I miss putting out records. I, I'm like, want to get back into doing this. Uh, and I mean, he, we've always been friends and kept on talking, but then he was like, like pitching this idea. Like I have this weird wild idea of like putting out these super limited editions of, of vinyl where people just get like, here's a record, do whatever, like we love to do whatever you want. We're not going to like, ask you for a single or we you don't even have to like sell a lot of records it's just like we just love your band have at it and then we're going to put that into like a subscription service for people who trust us like so he he was just like people i think people are going to trust us based on that you're the guy from lowrider and then i'm the guy who had meter city and we're then we're gonna be like hey sign up for getting records in the mail and uh we're gonna send you X amount of like releases over a year. And we we're going to call it post wax. And that idea was like, I think 2014 or 15. So it was like a while ago. Whoa, and I was just like, oh, yeah. that's a cool. I was just like, that's, oh, that's a cool idea. But I don't know. Uh, I'm busy. And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
Uh, I, I, I've got so much other stuff on my plate. I can't like start this now. And then he just kept coming back to me being like, uh, dude, I, uh, so elders is done for post wax. They signed. I was like, what you got elder. <laughs> I was just like, okay, that's cool. He was like, Hey, I, 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 I got this new thing from, um, from Bob from, from Fu Manchu. And it was like, it's called big scenic nowhere it's like they're also on post like, okay so post yeah. a thing now okay i guess we're doing this and then at the same time we were like doing the new laura record i was just like realized like oh we should put that on post wax so post wax was really this <laughs> this this sort of just idea of like you can do whatever you want something that you can't do on a regular label and then we created blues funeral to host that as a label so it, it, Blue's Funeral is is a, me and Jad created that mostly Jad, but I I'm sort of uh, around as a creative uh, counterpart to do all the artwork and everything. So we we started that and then put out the first year of Post Wax, which w- was like I don't know it took so much time, <laughs> and we just try to reinvent <laughs> what a vinyl record can be, um, but so uh that's really how like it all blended into the release of refractions and post wax at the same time um and now like it just it's just snowballed into jad is now doing it <coughs> putting out a lot of stuff <clears throat> under the under the label and we're now doing a second year of of post wax where we are putting out our next next ep with low rudder together with oh, elephant yeah Tree. <laughs> so that's going to be one that's of the awesome. releases and then we have then we have tons of other really cool bands that um oh yeah one, one band yeah. that i one band that i know you're gonna flip out when i tell you but i can't tell you yet but uh we're, we're, there's just gonna be some <laughs> really solid releases on there so yeah okay, I, okay. I'm, I'm smack in the i'm smack like in the middle of doing all the artwork and processing everything for for the second year of post wax and at the same time we're recording the next couple of songs with lowrider so it's yeah it's like busy days here <laughs> that's awesome well i have a last question for you because <laughs> I, I can talk yeah, to sure. you hours probably but <laughs> you don't have enough time sadly but if you know some bands from latin america from mexico and of course the question is if someday you will play here or in south america uh thing is i mean I, I I have very little time checking out new music. I'm sort of a boring person like that. I usually listen to the stuff <laughs> that I work with, like on for Blues Funeral. And then I'm so focused on recording my own uh, music that yeah. it's sort of, I'm sort of tired of music at the end of the day. Because I also work as a music producer. So it's like I work with recording music, uh, recording drums, and then also like my own stuff. So but I mean, I really love uh, uh, Los Natas or Natas. That was yeah, yeah, yeah. They were from Mexico, right? Yeah, from Argentina. I, 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 from Argentina, okay. From Ar- Argentina, I love, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I love them, especially like the uh, Corsario Negro. I think is. Sí, uh, Corsario Negro. Sí, sí, sí. Corsario Negro. Yeah, that that record. I mean, I I listen to a lot of their stuff, and we actually met up in sweden once but uh i'd say that they they must be the band that has sort of i've listened to the most and that yeah. record uh, especially uh is planeta solitario i think is is the, sí. uh, the opening track sí, sí, sí. Uh, it's just like it, it's like for people that haven't listened to that record that opening riff and that just the whole it's just got this sort of forward momentum that i love so much um so so that one for me but then us okay. playing in south america i'd love to but i yeah. i we'll we'll see maybe in the future it's like it's very far away yeah. and 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 i we, know i know <laughs> the thing is like i don't know i'm i'm also trying to be kind of like environmentally uh like aware and just the thought of like as a, on a daily basis or like often sitting in a an airplane just going to the other side of the globe just also feels like i have a hard time like motivating that to my kids um 
Yeah. But but I I mean I it, the thing is I'd love to play. I just have a hard time with my conscience, like with the traveling part, because since we're doing like mainly yeah uh, festival gigs and one-off stuff, we are always flying in, and it just I'm just starting to feel really bad about it. That's all. Uh, okay, okay, <clears throat> okay. But yeah, and 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 well, currently maybe... it's just like in in a, in a couple of years when our kids are like older, it's not as as hard yeah. for us to tour. But like just the last yeah. 10 years, we've all had like small kids. So being out touring like for weeks on end has not really been an option for us. That's why we've also been doing mainly like festival shows and one-off stuff. Uh, but we'll see if yeah, it changes. Totally. But I, I've also always hopefully, been hopefully. personally in. But yeah, hopefully, yeah. But I mean, per personally, also, I've always been more about like writing and recording music. I've never been like, I've never loved being in a tour van. So I I love playing. I just don't love the ninety five percent of touring that isn't playing. <laughs> yeah, it's just like oh, l l smell smelling van farts and and like just waiting <laughs> at a at a club is is sort of it's it's the name of the game, but it also is like it would mean I'm like yeah what what every musician has to deal with being away from their family for like months on end, and it's. I mean, I have friends in bands that have toured a lot that has sort of, I don't know, their relationship has gone to end because of it, or they have sort of uh, hit a, a brick yeah. wall and ha have really been exhausted from it. Like the, the my friends in, in Truck Fighters, that's one of the reasons they actually were like, uh, went on a hiatus be just because they were overworked from all the touring. So it's, it's really not like I... I've seen like the 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 bad end of like playing a lot of shows, so I'm like maybe I just like recording music, and I don't know if like <laughs> a lot of shows is for me, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll see. Not I, sure. I we're not gonna we're we're not gonna stop playing, and we'll definitely get like try to play as much as we can. Hopefully, hopefully someday. Well, yeah. thank you so much for your time. <laughs> it means a lot, and I have a lot of questions here. Maybe next time. Oh, we can we can do, an, yeah, we can do so. another one. <laughs> no worries, man. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I have tons of questions I, for you. You have yeah, a lot of fans and... here in Mexico or in in South America, so we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for your music. You are one of the best stoner bands in the scene, so I'm so happy to talk with you. And one last question is: if someday you will, um, how to say? Re-edit or I don't know the word. Re-release the the split with the, with Nebula. Uh, re-release a ratio, a ratio. Sorry, so, yeah, a ratio, a ratio yeah, of the split with yeah. Nebula. Oh, uh, we I mean we didn't really do a reissue of of just the split, but we did take yeah. those tracks and remaster them and put them out with O2IO. So the the gold version. Yeah, yeah, I have, I, have, there, I have here. Yeah. I mean, th th those have all the Nebula split tracks on them, but the the fact is that like the the Nebula tracks we we can't really put out. And I know that yeah, when I Jad's know. when 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 Jad sold the the record uh, the record label Meter City, uh, yeah, he no longer has the rights to put out that EP oh. on like Blue's Funeral. So I oh. I know that like the, those tracks are on the DOS EPs uh, thing that Nebula put yeah. out. <coughs> yeah. And then we have our tracks on O2i Deluxe. So yeah. at least the, well, they're out, they're out there. They're just not, they're not, they're just not there together. But the, yeah. the, yeah, the songs well, are definitely online. If, 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 if people want to listen to the tracks, they are online as yeah. the O2IO Deluxe. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much again. And I know if some final words for your fans here in Mexico. Uh, just we love you guys and thank you so much for caring and listening uh we'll definitely um play there if we can and until then expect new music really soon thank you so much for caring yeah thank you so much peter see you bye bye see you yes bye.